good late morning uh, to our guest, uh, David Card, who is connected from Berkeley. Uh, this is our third uh, Alan Krueger lecture. Alan Krueger has been at the seven edition of the festival, delivering uh, wonderful uh, lectures. Lecture that uh, I think uh, transferred to us two unforgettable characteristics of his uh, way of conceiving uh, the profession of economist. One was uh, the joy of research, really the passion, the enthusiasm that he devoted uh, to addressing always very, very relevant uh, issues. And the second is uh, the fact that uh, always policy must be based on empirical evidence. So the idea that uh, you should always carry out evidence-based economic policies. So we always want to remember these two features of Alan Krueger contribution, outstanding contribution to the profession in this lecture. We had a lecture by Hilary Hoynes on uh, safety nets, on minimum guaranteed income schemes. This was uh, two years ago. And last year, we had uh, another lecture by George Angrist on uh, education and on measuring the returns uh, to education. So tonight, we have another co-author of uh, Alan Krueger, who has been working not only on education, but on other very relevant fields for policy making. In particular, there is a, a work of David and uh, Alan on uh, the impact of a minimum wage rise in New Jersey that has been really a pioneering study and one of the most widely quoted, cited, and discussed paper in economics. Uh, it is a, a very interesting study because uh, it applies a new method to uh, establish causal effects of policies, in particular of the rise of a minimum wage. The idea there is that uh, you not only should look at what happens, in this case uh, in New Jersey, in the labor market of New Jersey, when you increase the minimum wage, but you should also take into account of all other relevant factors that may confound or alter the impact of a minimum wage, and therefore you should take as a comparison another state, in this case Pennsylvania, where the minimum wage rise was not implemented but went through the same type of uh, shocks, of changes that uh, could have been affecting the New Jersey. So the idea is that not only you should take the difference between the situation before and after the minimum wage hike, but also the difference between New Jersey and Pennsylvania. This double difference approach has been really a pioneering uh, a component of studies in uh, labor economics, and not only labor economics, in development economics, in many other fields. And uh, so not only the result of the studies were uh, uh, particularly interesting and widely debated because they found that uh, the minimum wage hike in New Jersey was not destroying jobs as uh, many would have thought before and many, and according to many predictions of economic theory, uh, but, uh, uh, but also because of the new methodology that the study introduced. So I think that David Card is, is a person who really is uh, very important for us for this uh, um, uh, third Alan Krueger uh, lecture. Uh, Alan, uh, D David has been working on many other uh, uh, issues very relevant for uh, economic uh, policy uh, making. Uh, he has been uh, working very much, for instance, on the issue of migration, and there also his studies are extremely and widely uh, quoted. And he has been very, very influential on policy making without uh, taking all a stance. So what, what is nice of, the, of this way of thinking about the role of an economist is one that provides information to policy makers. And then the policy maker have to make a decision based on the trade-off that uh, economic research uh, suggests. Uh, migration, as I said, is a, and the issues that he has been addressing are always very important and at the same time very controversial. 
uh, migration was one, income support schemes for uh, uh, you know, people being in, in poverty is, is another one. Uh, tonight, is, David is going to talk about affirmative action for racial and gender diversity. Affirmative action is a, a case where you tend to alter selection procedure for some position because you want to give more representation to some groups that seem to be underrepresented in this uh, selection. We have many examples, also in the Italian case, for instance, gender quotas in board of, of corporations. Um, and uh, uh, the application of, of a method of analysis of David Card to two uh, cases in the US will be for us extremely uh, interesting. So we are very glad that, uh, David, you accepted our invitation. And uh, without further ado, I don't want to take any more of your, of your time. Uh, the floor is yours for this uh, third Alan Krueger lecture. Thank you so much. Um, I, it's a great honor for me to uh, be able to give this lecture. Um, I have actually given a lecture live in, in Trento um, some years ago, and I enjoyed it very much. And I know, um, as you mentioned, that Alan had given a talk there. And he, I have to say, he loved the, he loved the Trento setup. He loved the idea of being able to communicate uh, with a broad audience and uh, get across some of his ideas and um, also to publicize economics and make uh, people um, comfortable with some of the ideas that the newer ideas that uh, Alan and others were coming out with. Um, it's also nice for me because I was Alan's colleague for many years, um, for about 12 years, the f when he came as an assistant professor when I was uh, already on the faculty at Princeton and we worked on uh, many different topics together. And actually the last major project we worked on together was about affirmative action. So um, this is um, uh, uh, I think a good a good choice for for me. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and let's see if I can make this work. So uh, let me just go on quickly because I, I want to try and cover a bunch of material and leave lots of time for questions. Um, so uh, as was mentioned, affirmative action is a process that um, is introduced in cases where there's a selection process in the background that uh, there are concerns about. So examples would be uh, hiring processes, uh, admission to selective university, which is extremely important and controversial in the United States, and honors and awards. So who gets to be, um, for instance, the National Academy of Science in the United States or uh, other prestigious organizations similar in Europe. And lots of times when these processes, uh, people notice that the people being selected are much different than the underlying population, and that's a concern. And so uh, it's widely proposed to have some kind of a, a boost uh, for the underrepresented groups. And I'm going to use that term boost. Uh, it's a kind of an unusual term, uh, even in English. Um, so I apologize if it doesn't translate very well. But it, 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 what I, by what I mean a boost is an increase coming about through an explicit change in the policy for one of the groups. So uh, examples of this, as already mentioned, um, uh, the uh, female shares on corporate boards. Uh, there's a 2000 law in Italy, the Golfo Mosca law. Uh, California recently adopted a, a similar law, actually. Um, admission policies at selective universities, um, also um, hiring goals. Uh, so for instance, um, my own university at Berkeley in California, we have kind of soft targets for the gender mix of um, who we're going to try and hire as faculty with the goal of trying to increase in particular the fraction of of um, underrepresented minorities, so African American and Hispanic usually, and, um, and women, especially in fields like economics where there's relatively few women. Um, I'm going to show you some evidence uh, through the talk that uh, the use of these policies is on the rise. Uh, an example here, the National Academy, a very um, uh, prestigious organization in the United States. It's been around for more than 200 years. It admits about 100 people a year these days as, a, as an Academy Fellow. In 2010, so only 10 years ago, only 20% of the new fellows were, were female. This year, they broke, almost broke the 50% rate for the first time, so they got to 49%. And so they've really been 
changing that policy. And interestingly, that change has occurred even under the Trump administration. So it hasn't been the case that um, uh, this particular type of policy has been was rolled back uh, substantially uh, in the last few years. Nevertheless, these policies are extremely controversial, uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I thought it would be helpful to give a lecture. And, and, and was mentioned, this was really a characteristic of Alan, that um, Alan always felt that even in a very controversial area, um, an economist could help by trying to set some of the facts straight and uh, help people to make informed decisions about how a process works or how a new proposal works. And so that's going to be my goal uh, in this talk, really in honor of Alan's um, ideas. Um, so I'm going to talk about how affirmative action policies work, um, some of the consequences of those policies, and I'm going to be focusing on two specific settings that I happen to know about. One is a f recent uh, federal law case in the United States, and this was a case where Harvard University was litigated. In other words, there was a legal case against Harvard for their admissions policy, and some part of the, pol of the litigation you may have heard about was uh, to do with whether uh, Asian students were uh, admitted to Harvard at, um, at proportional rates or high enough rates. But the main part of the litigation was to an attempt to dismantle um, the affirmative action policy at Harvard. Um, and so I'll talk about that. And, and I was the expert witness for Harvard University in that case. And so I was intimately involved in preparing uh, all the exhibits and presenting um, the argument, the statistical arguments for Harvard uh, at the court. And the second uh, context I'm going to be using is, is going to look at honors for academic achievement uh, for people uh, later in their careers. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on three particular um, types of honors. The National Academy of Science honors I mentioned before. Another organization known as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And the third, actually the most important uh, for some purposes, is the Econometric Society. And uh, those of you who are really economics nerds will know that the Econometric Society is a pretty old, long-established society. Uh, it was established in the 1930s in Europe um, by a bunch of European economists, uh, including um, Norwegians and British people and so on. And this, uh, since the 1930s, has had um, honorific fellows. And so we'll be looking at who gets into that. And this is a joint work with uh, Stefano Della Vigna, uh, who's a native son from northern Italy. He's a... Uh, he was born in Como. Um, Nagori Iriberi, who's at um, the Basque University, and Patricia Funk, who's in the Italian University in Switzerland. Um, so why do organizations need affirmative action? Well, um, usually the, the need or the concern about affirmative action or the, the argument for it comes about because of concern about the lack of diversity in the outcomes of the selection process. Um, and so, in, for instance, in the Harvard case, um, they have a very explicit policy that says Harvard University, as a matter of policy, needs to have a critical mass of African-American students so that um, other students at Harvard can see the perspectives and understand some of the problems and understand some of the issues that really affect African-Americans and can uh, then be better equipped to um, deal with American life. Um, Similarly, the honorific societies uh, have, in the last few years especially, uh, started to realize that there would be benefits to the societies of having a broader perspective, having more, for instance, women uh, in, the, in these societies, possibly also as some kind of a symbolic gesture to young women who are thinking about going into science or wondering whether they should go into science to make people feel that actually it's perfectly uh, legitimate and, and um, uh, natural for women to be scientists as well as men. And so there, there's a lot of different values. Um, but the main one is to try and, uh, I think, to try and change the balance of who's getting in. So I'm going to talk about a, a somewhat of a kind of a, a almost mathematical but very simple mathematical model of how affirmative action works. And it, it turns out that's actually very helpful. Uh, this isn't going to be a uh, you know, complicated lecture in calculus or anything like that, but it's going to, I think I'm going to try and convince you that there is some value in understanding how affirmative action actually works. The simplest model of a candidate selection process, for instance, going to college or who gets to be uh, going into a college or who gets to be awarded an honor, would be to rank all the candidates by some qualifications. 
and then choose those with the qualifications above some cutoff. So if our qualifications are Q, that's the, uh, and those are um, variables that are distributed across the population in some way, uh, and then everybody that's above a certain um, rank would get in. And sometimes there's an explicit rule like there's only going to be 100 people admitted, so the top 100 people, you would find the, the cutoff that defined the top 100, and that's how you would go. Now that what that does is. technical problem I hope is going to be solved as we can't hear David let's see if our technicians uh, okay. have I come back I don't know, because this is the first time actually in this festival that we have a problem of this type. Okay, I'm going to turn off my video so it uses a little bit less bandwidth. No, I think there is no problem. I mean, we can see you and uh, everything was working well. We just had uh, a small problem. But now, please. please. You can share the screen and, and we can keep on. Okay, so I'll let me go back just 10 or 15 seconds um, and restart. I apologize for that. Um, so I'm going to be thinking about how Criterion works, and I'm thinking of a of, of one possible model of the selection process um, where um, there's a cutoff for Criterion. And um, in the case where there's a very sharp Criterion that everyone above that Criterion gets in and everybody below it does not get in, we have a uh, a, a rule that looks like this graphically. On the x-axis is qualifications. So candidates are qualified in different degrees. So people may have, for instance, in the Harvard case, they would have different levels of academic achievement and different other characteristics, like whether they're good in sports and so on. And they would be ranked. And there would be a, a cutoff uh, here that would um, uh, determine who gets in and those above that cutoff get in. And on the y-axis is the probability of selection. So that jumps from zero to one as we pass through the cutoff. So that's a very sharp, straightforward rule. Now in reality, uh, that's not how it really works. And the reason is twofold. One is that most of the time we don't fully observe all the qualifications. Uh, and so inevitably there's some noise uh, in the process. So somebody's looking at two candidates to be selected for a process or to be hired. Oftentimes it's kind of hard to see the difference between them and at the end of the day there may be something that happens and there's quite a few studies in economics of uh, the variation that caused by things like um, what time of day it is or what you had for lunch or whether your sports team won uh, the football match last night that determine to some extent uh, the gatekeepers decisions. So I'm going to be thinking about a slightly more complicated model where there's a combination of qualifications and noise or uh, discretion in some cases. So sometimes you could have even um, uh, a biased judge or a biased um, uh, hiring uh, manager that could potentially tip the balance one way or the other. In that case, there's going to be an S-curve. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this S-curve uh, in the probability. So let me just show what that looks like. So instead of the blue line here, which is the sharp curve, when there's a little bit of noise, you get an S-curve. And I've shown two S-curves here, one with a small amount of noise, which is almost a, a step curve, and one with a larger amount of noise, which looks more like an S. And you can see what happens with an S-curve uh, on the next diagram. So here I'm showing uh, what you get if there is um, some noise in the system is you get three types of candidates. You get people to the left who have no chance of selection. So they basically are so far below any kind of cutoff that they're never going to be selected. And that's pretty important. For instance, in the Harvard case, uh, more than 60 or 70 percent of candidates who apply for Harvard really, in all honesty, have no chance of getting in. Uh, 
Uh, there's a few candidates to the right, the, the sure things I'm going to call them. Those are the candidates who would get in almost for sure. So they're so outstanding, they're so stellar. Uh, now that's the size of that group can actually be surprisingly small, uh, depending on how uh, elite is the selection process you're thinking about. So if you're thinking about the National Academy of Science, where only 100 scientists in the whole United States get selected each year, there are virtually no sure things. Uh, so you could you could have a the curve you would never see anybody who with with a probability uh, one hundred percent would be selected. Comes from college admissions in the United States, and I have to say I did not grow up in the United States. Uh, I grew up in Canada where things work differently. But every student in the United States uh, knows about this concept of being kind of in between the group that has no chance of getting in and the group that has a, a hundred percent chance of getting in. And they, they, Americans refer to that as the bubble. Uh, I don't know why the term bubble is used, but the people on the bubble are the people that have some chance of getting in. And the, uh, sometimes people think specifically about someone whose probability of getting in is 50-50. So they're kind of halfway along the S-curve where they're there's going to be just a very arbitrary selection. So if that's the kind of uh, process for selection, you can still have different cutoffs, but what it's going to do is it's going to change the S-curve for the groups. And so I'm going to think about a situation where we have a, a group A of people that are the uh, ordinary group, so that could be, for instance, the men. B, who are the group that we're trying to improve their chances of getting in, and so we're going to give them a different selection criteria. Uh, and so what you're going to get is two S-curves, one for group one, that's the green group, for instance, that could be the men uh, being selected for National Academy of Science, or the white students being selected for admission to Harvard. And the blue line, that's the S-curve for the other group. Now, again, notice that there are uh, a very interesting pattern here uh, because to the left there's still a large group of people who aren't going to get in, not going to get selected, but it's a little bit smaller for the privileged group, the B group. The sure thing group is also uh, present. It's a little bit bigger for the group that's shifted to the right. And then there's a again a complete set of bubble students and what happens or or candidates and what happens is that those that group of people on the bubble is shifted a little bit to the right. Now if you think about how does the affirmative action policy benefit and who does it benefit, you can see that by thinking about a candidate with a given level of qualifications. So that's a, a some point on the x-axis. So for instance, think of the point um, here at the uh, very beginning of the S-curve. Those candidates have very, very low probability, almost zero, if they're in the ordinary group, for instance, the white students group. They have a little bit higher probability if they're in the uh, advantage group, so the minority group, for instance, in the Harvard case. But notice that the gain in their probability isn't very big. Similarly, over here at the far right, or at the right, you can see at the end of the S-curve, the same pattern. There's a little bit higher chance, but it can't be raised very much because actually you can only go up to 100%. So you, if you're pretty highly qualified, very close to the end of the S, you can only go up to 100%, so the gain is small. The group in the middle of the bubble, that's the group that has the big gain. And you can see for people right in the middle of the bubble, that there could be quite a significant benefit. And this is kind of the paradox of affirmative action policies. Many, many people are not benefiting at all. So this broad group of people that are um, no chance is still present. They don't get any uh, benefit from the affirmative action policy. Similarly, the most highly qualified group gets no benefit. It's only the people in the bubble range. And in the bubble range, there's quite a heterogeneity of, of treatment. There could be a, a benefit that's big or small. Okay, now that's a model. Is it really true? Is that how it really works? Well, I had a lot of experience with this because in the Harvard case, we had to analyze how affirmative action worked in the admissions process. And what we did was we developed a model 
for admissions that included all the characteristics of the students that the admissions committee would see. So SAT scores, that's the score that everyone knows about if they're applying to an American school, um, athletic achievements, uh, other kinds of um, volunteer work you had done and so on. And we were able to um, estimate models with and without um, affirmative action and see what happened. And what we found is summarized here. So this is two of the advantage groups. Uh, on the left is African-American students, on the right is Hispanic students. And we rank them by their um, strength of their um, portfolio. So that's exactly the same as the qualification type of graph I was showing before. And you can see for the bottom five deciles, or even six deciles, there's virtually no benefit for the affirmative action program at Harvard for African Americans in those deciles, exactly as the graph we had before. You can see there's a pretty strong benefit for, as we go a little bit further, then these are the people kind of in the bubble range. And at the 10th decile, there's a little bit smaller effect than for the 9th, which is consistent with them, them being closer to the top of the S. So there's a little bit less benefit. For Hispanic students, there's a, oh, for Hispanic students, there's a similar pattern, not quite as start, uh, stark. And you can see that um, there's a kind of an increase, but only, there's a benefit for affirmative action for Hispanic students, but only for the top 20% or so of students, 25% of students at most. Okay, so how much affirmative action do you need? Well, it depends on what criteria you have, but if your criteria is uh, related to the fraction of people in the selected pool that will actually get in, then what you need to do is you need to consider two things. First, how big is the underlying share of group B? This is the group we're, we're worried about. I'm gonna call that S. And secondly, what are the probabilities of selection for group A and group B? And those I'm going to think of as two numbers, PA and PB. And it's a very simple exercise in math to show that the fraction of people who get selected that are in group B is affected by S and PB. So what you need to have a high fraction of, say, African-American students at Harvard is you need to have a relatively high S and you need to have a relatively high PB. And of course, for something like African Americans, that's only about 10% of all students. So S is only 0.1. So you know that you can only have, uh, if, if the PA and PB are equal, you could only have 10% of students at Harvard would be African American, uh, even in the absence of any difference between white and black students. And of course, if the underlying qualifications of African American students are lower, then you're going to have an even lower share. And you can think about that mathematically in terms of two um, parameters or two constants that you could uh, play with. One would be, what's the relative rate of preference or um, probability in the absence of affirmative action? So I'm gonna call that uh, P0B. That's the probability that um, say black students would get into Harvard in the absence of affirmative action relative to the same probability for white students, PA. And so Delta, is the ratio of probabilities in the absence of affirmative action. And you might think that's less than one, it might be like 80% or 20, 25% or some number like that. Now what affirmative action does is boosts the probability from that uh, P0B, and so the boost factor I'm gonna call beta. And as a result of the combination of some differences in qualification of the two groups and the affirmative action policy, you really have a two parameters. One is where would you be without affirmative action? That's the delta. And then how much do you change that? That's the beta. And you can uh, effectively increase the beta by lowering the, the qualification bar for the uh, group of interest, the group B. And the optimal degree of that depends on how much you want to push uh, the selection process to achieve a certain fraction uh, in the uh, ultimate pool. Now I have um, the next question I want to address is I want to ask um, affirmative action is very controversial. And a lot of people have thought about an alternative to affirmative action. They say, well, why can't we do something that's a little, that seems a little fairer? For instance, in the admissions to university case, what if instead of benefiting people who are uh, African-American, we tried to give a preference for low-income people? 
uh, we know that African Americans on average have lower income than white Americans. And so we, if we try and uh, privilege lower income, that's, that's kind of a race neutral policy that might be politically more saleable. There's a very important mathematical result that's been proved by a number of different economists. Um, and that is that any kind of indirect affirmative action of this type where I, I don't focus on race per se, but I focus on something correlated, will necessarily lead to lower qualifications in the selected group, holding constant the fraction of people that you get of the target group in that pool. So if you want to get 15% African Americans at Harvard, the most efficient way to do that is to target directly uh, African Americans by giving them a lower boost. And again, uh, we had a we had a chance to empirically test this in the Harvard case, because um, we could take the admissions process that they use at Harvard and we could evaluate what would happen if instead of using um, affirmative action directly, you gave a boost or a change in the um, award that the admission system gives for lower income families. And so what we did was we experimented with a range of possible uh, positive benefits that the admission system could give to lower income families. And we showed that um, in, if you do that, now this is a somewhat complicated graph. This is directly from the trial. So it's a, a complicated uh, graph, but very colorful. The, the left-hand panel, the left-hand bar shows the actual composition of the class at Harvard in terms of the racial composition. So 40% white, 24% Asian, 14% uh, Hispanic, 14% African American, and 8% other. The next panel shows what would happen if we took away all the racial preferences. And you can see that the fraction of whites would go up, the fraction of Asians would go up, the fraction of black and Hispanic would fall quite substantially. So instead of representing 28%, those two groups together, they would only represent around 15% or about half as many as they currently have. And then these uh, additional bars show what would happen if you implied bigger and bigger boosts to um, this target income uh, uh, metric and said, okay, I want to give a higher and higher and higher boost to income. You can see as we go raising the, the multiple of the boost, you can see that what happens is we gradually get more minority students, but uh, most of that effect actually goes to Hispanic students. They're much lower income than African American students who apply to Harvard. And so you get some increase in the boost. If you want to get to something like 28% uh, of the uh, student pool at Harvard, um, being either African American or Hispanic, you have to go to kind of the middle here, the one that's highlighted. And that's about a, a, a in the range of these boosts that we considered, that was about a four times boost. Now, what did that do? We evaluated that by looking at the four criteria that Harvard used, and they rank students in four dimensions on a one to four scale. One is exceptional, really, basically, and no one we've ever met is a one. A two is really very, very strong. And so they really want, we're concerned to have one or two. So at least two rating on these four dimensions, academics, extracurricular activities. So that's things like clubs you belong to, things you do to help your local hospital. Personal rating, that would be things like, are you helping out with your family? Are you somebody that everybody looks to in a leadership role? And athletics, of course, that's very important in American universities because they want to have a strong intramural sports. Uh, and you can see that across all four dimensions, if you were to try and replace direct affirmative action with uh, a boost to SES or a boost to uh, socioeconomic status, you would actually lose on all the dimensions. <laughs> the biggest loss is actually in athletics, which Harvard puts a very high weight on. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is I want to take a very brief uh, but uh, somewhat deeper uh, look at the uh, selection of honors for economists. And so the reason to do this is because um, we can find very long historical data. So what we did was we constructed lists of all the economists who had published papers in any journal, any of about 40 journals, over the last century. And we constructed for each economist an evolving curriculum vita, a CV, that showed how many papers they had published at that point and how many citations they had accumulated at that point. And we're able to do this all the way back to the 1920s. 
and we were able to assign genders to everyone based on their names. So, um, except in Italy, an Andrea is um, female. So we, we also had a, luckily we had Stefano on the team so we could straighten out the Andreas. Um, so you can assign names and uh, we can then develop models of who gets selected. And we do this for the Econometric Society which started selecting fellows in the 30s, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences which started selecting fellows in the 40s and the National Academy of Science which only uh, decided that economists were scientists in 1968. So they'd been selecting lots of other scientists but not economists. And the uh, interesting thing about all three of these societies is there's a nomination process, which involves uh, some individual input from members as well as a committee. And then there's a vote by existing fellows. So the preferences that you're seeing here are not the preferences of um, some committee or some hiring manager. These are the preferences of the members of these committees, the people who themselves have become members of these organizations, the people who themselves have, are fellows. So think of it as the, the most distinguished people in the field uh, as selected in the past are uh, selecting new people. And uh, what we see is very interesting. And here I'll start by showing the data for the Econometric Society. And we're looking at the impact on the fraction of women who become new fellows. And the red line is kind of a very important reference. That's the fraction of all the existing economists out there in the world, as far as we can tell. So that's around 25,000 people who have published a paper and are still active in their careers. And in the 1970s, only 5% of those were female. And as you can see from the red line, that has been steadily rising and is now around 20%. So we now have around 20% of the active publishing economists are female. The uh, green line is a measure of the fraction of highly qualified economists who are female. So there what we did was we said, let's take all the economists in our, in our set that we've been following and let's get all of those that have published at least three papers in one of the five top journals in the field and so the economists who are listening will know which, which journals I mean um, but in the interest of time I won't go through that that list but there are five very prestigious journals the same five for the last hundred years um, and you can see that in that fraction the fraction of women was also but even much lower it was about half as big about two and a half percent back in the 70s and it's still about half as big uh, today so it's around um, just under 10 percent today out of 20. So the women are rising uh, in the field. They're also rising as a share of those who are uh, highly, highly successful with at least these three pubs, but it's still quite a low rate. And finally, the purple line, that's the fraction of women who are selected as new fellows. And you can see that that was following the trend for the, the green line very similarly up to around 2008 or 2009, and then it starts to take off. And so we go from a situation where uh, only about uh, five or six percent of the new fellows are female to a situation where it's getting close to 20 percent at this point. So it's about the fraction of all economists who are female, much higher than the fraction who are um, highly qualified. And that's evidence of this positive affirmative action. Now, interestingly, we if we fit more complicated models, very complicated models, in fact, we see sort of three eras. We see prior to 1980 that um, women were probably just very strongly dis uh, discriminated against. So there were many examples of very f famous, uh, prominent female scholars who never were made fellows of the Economic Society in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, then in the 80 to 2000 period, to 2010 period, we see kind of a proximity quality. And then from 2010 onward, we see a, a kind of a change. And interestingly, we see the same kind of pattern in the other two societies. So this is the fraction of women who are new fellows in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Econometric Society, and the National Academy of Sciences. And you can see that all three of those were very dismal uh, back until around maybe around 2000 and then they gradually start to increase. Nowadays the fraction of uh, new fellows for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences is over 40 percent so they're doing a, a pretty strong affirmative action policy to try and um, uh, bring in um, eligible women. But the, and the Econometric Society and the National Academy of Science are lower but still substantially above where they were. So 
Now, my final graph is going to show you what's been going on in other fields. Economics isn't the only field that this has happened in. So this is um, uh, a total of um, five fields. Uh, psychology, that's the green line. Social science, which is sociology, uh, that's the purple line. Uh, physics and math, which are often compared to economics, kind of a math heavy uh, side of uh, uh, the, the fields. And you can see that um, in, in all cases, there's been some very significant change. This, the change occurred about uh, a decade or 15 years earlier in psychology. Psychology went from almost no female candidates to it's now been kind of hovering around 50% for quite some time. Uh, sociology, uh, which some of, many of you probably know a little bit about that field, is fairly high fraction women. Uh, in the base of people who are scholars in the field and now is up to around 30 percent of all fellows but even into the 1990s it was pretty low and even math and physics are now um, making some strides so let me stop with a slide of conclusions um, affirmative action policies appear to be on the rise we've just seen some evidence of that for instance the these honorific societies have really dialed up preferences for women um, direct affirmative action is more efficient than policies that favor uh, correlated attributes. That was a kind of a mathematical theorem that the Harvard case proves very clearly. Uh, so we, I think we have very strong evidence that that's true. Affirmative action policies mainly benefit highly qualified people in the target group. So the vast majority of people uh, in many cases, especially cases where the selection probability is relatively low, like Harvard, for instance, only five or 6% of all people get in or to become an honor, honorary fellow of the National Academy, the probabilities are well under a tenth of a percent per year. So most people don't benefit. Uh, the people who do benefit are at the very top of the field. And so what you get kind of paradoxically is that you get a widening of inequality within the target group. So now there's a very small set of women or a very small set of African-American students who get the big prize. Uh, but the vast majority get nothing. The size of the AA preference uh, that an organization will need depends on the gap between the desired outcome. For instance, um, do you want to have 50% of all women in the fellow, the new fellows rate, and the share of the group in the highly qualified pool? So if the if the if the target group, the group B that I've been talking about, is a relatively small fraction of the target pool. Uh, then you're going to have to have fairly significant affirmative action to get a desired outcome like 50-50 in the new uh, selected pool. And in the Harvard admissions case and in the honor, honors for economists in the recent decades, that has implied very significant boosts on the order of doubling or even tripling the probability that you get in uh, because of the, your target status. So uh, that's I'm going to stop with those conclusions, and, and I'll be glad to take some questions uh, or comments from the uh, audience. So thank you so much for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, you uh, told us at the outset that uh, you had been uh, before at the Festival of Economics in presence, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't uh, uh, take uh, some of the time available to us to remind uh, all of us uh, uh, all the uh, honors you achieved for your uh, achievement in, uh, in research and uh, you know, while being uh, a member of a sure thing group. Um, uh, so it was not needed because you had been before here. Um, your results are extremely interesting, and we hope that you will be uh, back to Trento uh, in presence when we will all be not only the people. The nice thing is that uh, we are back to having people in the room, uh, unlike last year, and there are many young people here, so that's wonderful uh, to see, and we hope to have you uh, with us uh, back uh, here soon. What you said is very relevant, actually, also for decisions that have to be made in Italy very soon, because uh, um, the national plans for reform that is being uh, presented by the Italian government for the recovery fund uh, involve the fact that uh, they want to get more hirings of young and women in the public sector to carry out uh, these plans. Uh, 
And uh, given that uh, rules for hiring in the public sector uh, do not allow to have uh, uh, quotas or preferential rules for men, for women, or for young people based on age or gender, uh, they plan to use some indirect rules like uh, you know education or other things. And what you uh, indicate is that this indirect method may not be that efficient. So what you said is extremely relevant also from this standpoint and something very uh, you know important uh, nowadays in our countries. But I'm sure that uh, uh, there are questions from the floor and. Uh, so we can take a few. So is someone, I please ask you to come here, keep the mask, and uh, talk from this, uh, speak from this uh, microphone over here. Uh, also, you can also ask questions in Italian because there is the simultaneous translation, so. Okay. No, no, keep the mask on, Sorry. please. Thank you for the, for the lecture, first of all. And also, uh, I just wanted to ask you uh, whether you were aware of any evidence of um, persistent effects of these policies in the longer term. Uh, um, because most of, many times these policies are justified as uh, having longer term effects on, on the shares uh, because of maybe role models, the increase of number in role, role models and things like that. I was wondering, even though I know these policies are very recent, I, I was wondering whether you, you were aware of anything, uh, uh, any work on longer term effects. Thank you, uh, well, again. Yeah, thank, thank you, that, that, that's an extremely good question. Um, uh, I think in fact, in the case of affirmative action for university admissions, um, the Supreme Court of the United States had at one time said that they really wanted the affirmative action policies to be uh, short duration, you know, to, to not go on forever. Um, so because as you, as you pointed out, um, th these policies are um, fairly recent, for instance, you can see um, in the National Academy case or the Economic Action Society case, we're talking about the last 10 years. We have to kind of rely on slightly indirect evidence. And, and I'm sure many of the people in the room are aware of, uh, of studies of peer group effects that are very widespread in economics and one class of those peer effects are studies of things like um, if you have a female teacher or you have a female professor or a female mentor are you more likely to succeed or are you more likely to pursue a certain class of uh, policies if you're a female student and there's uh, related work on African Americans um, if you have a if you're an African American student in a uh, university and uh, you have a professor, it, your math professor is African American, does that influence you? Uh, so there's a fair amount of work like that and I would say although the results are somewhat mixed, I think they tend to point toward a positive role model effect. Um, so you could expect some um, changes in outcomes. Um, I think people are most interested in the U.S. context in um, what they call STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math. And uh, so that's uh, actually economics is a STEM subject in the United States. So that's like physics, math, engineering, all those kind of fields, the fields that the National Academy of Science actually represents. And in that's historically very underrepresented for women and has we've been making some very significant progress in many of the STEM fields, but not all. Uh, actually, economics has been really pretty far behind. So I think that there's some evidence of, of role model effects. It's I'm not aware of any really great evidence um, of really quick and large effects. I think the effects are often modest and maybe somewhat slow to build up. So I think we shouldn't, we should be hoping that there are such effects, but I, we have to be a little bit cautious. I'm over here. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, I'm sorry, I just have to look at the picture while I ask the question. Uh, 
Uh, in the, in the uh, female shares of new fellows graph for the um, society of uh, the academic society, uh, you show with the, the green line that um, just a, a certain part of the newly selected women is, uh, is highly qualified in some way. So um, you show that we have about 20% of the members which are um, women and just about a half is uh, some woman with at least three top five publications. Uh, so some, some could argue that uh, to, to make room for the women, we decided to take some women which are not actually uh, high qualified. Um, but you didn't show the, 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 same, uh, the same graph for men, so I was wondering if uh, all men selected are actually high qualified or it's almost the same, so just the part is highly qualified, while the other part is, of course, very, very good academ um, academy members, but not exactly the, the best as, as the um, definition of high, highly qualified says. Right, that's a very good question. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up. Um, so actually, a mo Almost everybody that gets to be, uh, a, say, an econometric society fellow has an extraordinary <laughs> record. Um, so they would have multiple journal publications, but not always. The econometric society ten also rewards people who, for instance, um, were uh, very influential in running a major institution, a statistical agency in some cases, or um, at, say a university where lots of um, there was a strong economics department for a very long time and the society also uh, has a program of um, trying to increase diversity um, for representation from around the world so in Asian countries and um, South America and in, in, in even African countries and what you see is that um, there to the extent that there are people with with limited CVs uh, less publications, they would tend to be men <laughs> from those settings. So some other type of affirmative action has pushed them in. Now almost inevitably they are men, but they are probably the beneficiaries of a different kind of preference. But if you're just going with straight academics, uh, a typical person who would be admitted to the Economic Society would have um, let's say five to 10 publications in a top five journal. Um, and the, uh, the female candidates would tend to have one to two fewer. Uh, the way we, in our estimation models, we, we codify it in terms of um, different types of journals. And the most important journal for getting into the Econometric Society is the journal of the society itself, which is called Econometrica. And so being female is kind of the equivalent of having um, one or 1 1.2 extra econometricas. So as, as I was trying to say with that S-curve diagram, you're really benefiting quite highly qualified women. There's not any women getting in who are, um, you know, not with a pretty outstanding CV. Uh, but there is um, a, a, a gap, a noticeable gap. can take uh, another last question. Yes, please. As always, come over here. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for the question. Apologies, this is not my field at all, so... Sorry. Uh, apologies, this is not my field at all, so uh, I apologize if this is a naive question, but... I'm wondering, um, you know, uh, rather than actually having policies towards affirmative action, should we actually treat the root cause? Because it seems to me that we are really treating the symptoms here. So rather than, you know, uh, having uh, disadvantaged communities, uh, rather than having the quotas and everything else, what about focusing on really improving their uh, SES? Thank you. I th thanks for that. I think that's um, 
that's actually um, that's a very <laughs> that's an Alan Kruger kind of comment. Um, and I think that everyone, you, you know, certainly believes that um, we should try and encourage, um, you know, talented women to pursue science and, and math and economics profession type fields. We should try and get, um, you know, talented African-American students to um, do well in, in high school and, and be prepared to enter into um, university. I think the reality is, though, that the costs of that and the benefit are so high, and the set of programs we have that seem to work are somewhat limited. So if you're thinking about where will we be 5 or 10 or 15 years from now, um, one of the strongest cases for affirmative action, I think, would be, for instance, um, in the Harvard case, if you said, I need to have a bunch of lawyers who were educated at Ivy League schools and go to the best law schools who are African American and can make arguments for uh, maintaining civil rights law and expanding um, civil rights law and keeping voting rights and so on. And the only way that you can have that group of people on the ground 10 years from now is going to be to make a choice today about who gets into Harvard or Yale or Princeton this year. So I think that's the that's the kind of the choice that we have to think about a little bit. Obviously, you know, my personal view would be that it would be very important to try and spend more money and and do more research and figure out what works and try lots of different things and Alan Kruger spent a huge amount of his career emphasizing uh, changes in the education system that could potentially benefit, especially Alan and I did quite a bit of work on minority uh, education programs. So I think we, I think we, that's a, a separate thing though, in my view, because the reality is with the students we have today, they are going to be the leaders tomorrow. And if we don't have African Americans or we don't have women tomorrow or five years from now, we're going to then delay things much longer. So that that's the argument that people would make. Indeed. But that's a very good and question and, and obviously one of the deepest ones. <laughs> yeah. Some of the justification being provided for affirmative action is that affirmative action creates the condition to overcome also this type of regulation. And, but whenever we, 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 we there are this type of presentation, I always have a kind of envy with respect to the data that often are available on the other side of the, of the Atlantic. But uh, we will get there at some stage, and we will be able to carry out the same type of uh, analysis and to guide the economic policy as you did so well uh, there. So thank you again, David, for being with us. And uh, again, we hope to have you with us uh, when the festival will be back to normality with all the people and the speakers in the same room. So thank you, thank you again.